blessed morning everybody we're gonna start now so let's pray and lift this time before the lord uh, before we start heavenly father we praise you we acknowledge that jesus is the lord of lords and the king of kings lord we thank you lord that he has been sent so that we might have life and have it more abundantly we thank you that he has been sent so that we can live the overcoming life and we thank you that this book that we are studying is a book about victory. It is a book about overcoming. And we thank you, Lord, in spite of all the things that are going on in this earth, we have this knowledge that we have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And so this morning, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit to hover above each person that is listening here. We thank you that uh, you will personally be their teacher and that, Lord, you will guide my lips as I speak and that you will help us to understand and unveil the truths that are in the book of Revelation to our hearts. And we ask this in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, you will find in Revelation Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 it is an outline of uh, the contents of the whole book so in a way you know uh, the Holy Spirit inspired John to write this verse to give us a brief outline of what this whole book is all about and here we find that there are three things mentioned here there are things that are in the past and uh, Jesus through the Holy Spirit uh, speaking by the Spirit told uh, John to write the things which you have seen, referring to the things of the past. You know, you remember that in the book of John, 1 John, John said uh, uh, what we have seen, what we have looked at, what our ears have heard, what we have touched, this we proclaim to you and we proclaim the life to you. Amen. So uh, he was told to write the things which you have seen and then the things which are, and these are the present things that he's about to see and the things which will take place. So I will very briefly give you a, an outline of the whole book. You'll find in Revelation chapter 1, these are the things which John had seen. Things about the past concerning uh, the vision of the Son of Man. In Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, the things which are present and Jesus here is talking to the seven churches. So in chapter 2 and 3, you find his message to the seven churches which are presently existing at the time when John was writing this episode. From Revelation chapter 4 all the way until 22, uh, Jesus told John to write things that will take place after this. So here Jesus was referring to the future. So giving you a brief outline, you see that from uh, chapter 4 onwards, um, Jesus is telling John about the future. So you see that in uh, chapter 4 and 5, uh, there is, uh, John is taken up into heaven and he saw the throne in heaven. From chapter 4 onwards uh, until all the way to chapter 8, is a description, especially in chapter 6, uh, it's talking about the seven seals. And I believe that these are the, uh, as Jesus said, as we get nearer and nearer to the end of the age, the travail, the woman who is uh, giving birth, her travail will get more and more intense and her travail will get closer and closer together. So as we read chapter 6, you'll find that the seven seals are being recounted for John. And in chapter 7 and in chapter 8, there seems to be a pause, or I would call it an interlude. So we're going to talk about the interlude, I think, next week. But for today and for Monday, we are going to talk about the seven churches. And I pray that I'll be able to get through seven churches in two days which gives me about 15 to 20 minutes per church, okay? So I try to keep to that time. 
and then from chapter 6 onwards to chapter 19, um, uh, John is describing the tribulation period, which is a seven-year period divided into two parts. Uh, actually, you could say in the book of Revelation, John writes about the three aspects of the tribulation uh, the, the, the tribulation period. The first half is found in chapters 6 to chapters 9 where the seven trumpet judgments are sent forth and then from chapter 10 until chapter 14 you'll find John describes the middle of the tribulation where you see this uh, three people or rather three personalities uh, emerge and I call them the terrible three, okay? Uh, they are firstly, the first person here, or first personality is Satan. The second personality is the Antichrist. And the third personality is the false prophet. So you'll find their descriptions in chapters 10 until chapters 14. Then a book also from chapter 15, all the way to chapter 19, you find the description of the uh, Great Tribulation. And this is where seven bowls of God's wrath are being poured out into the earth. And then uh, from cha on chapter 19 onwards, we see the Kingdom of Christ being announced. Chapter 19 is the Kingdom Announcement and then chapter 20 to 22, uh, there's a description here of the new heavens and the new earth. Okay. Okay. So let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. And we find that this uh, message is given to the entire church for the entire church age. Look at this um, map here. Uh, the seven churches are in a circuit. So when uh, John wrote, uh, wrote the, the letters, uh, remember that he was the bishop of all these churches. He was the elder, the bishop of all these churches. And he wanted the letters to be read to all the churches. So they were supposed to send the circular letter uh, to every church and they were supposed to read it to the churches uh, one at a time. And this is a picture of the Isle of Patmos where John was exiled for over a year. He was exiled in his 90s. And then later on, uh, when uh, Domitian, the emperor, died, he was sent back to, uh, to Ephesus. And that's where he, he ministered until his death. So we're going to look at the message to the seven churches. Remember that it is uh, a message to the entire church for the entire church age. So, um, the, by, the whole Bible is written to believers, you know, either Jews or Christians, but not all of the Bible is written to Christians. Uh, Paul tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that these things, the things in the Old Testament, even though they were written to the Jews, uh, they were written for our learning for our admonition and they were used as examples for us. So not everything in the Bible was written to the church or to the Christian. However, in the New Testament, particularly the epistles, they are written to the church as well as the book of Revelation. And in particular, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3, it is addressed directly to the church. So we ought to take a special note of this because these messages are directly written to us. So it is God's love letter to us and God gave us a promise in these letters that in Revelations you will find the references here. Chapter 2 verses 7, 11, 17 and 26. And then you'll find them also in chapter 3, verses 5, 12, and 21. These are God prom God's promises to all the overcomers. So 
you know, thank God that uh, because we are born again, we have been given the ability to overcome and to, to live above our situation and our circumstances. Mm. You know, Christians thrive the best when there's difficulty. That's how God made us because we are made in the image of Jesus Christ. So we were recreated in the image of Jesus Christ and the way that we were recreated is that we thrive the best when there is difficulty. We thrive the best when there is persecution and hardship. Amen. Mm. Let's look at the, uh, the Ephesian uh, church, the church at Ephesus. And I've given a name to each of these churches. Uh, Ephesus is uh, maybe Maybe the church that has lost its love, so it's the loveless church. Smyrna was the persecuted church. Pergamos was the compromising church. Thyatira was the corrupt church. Sardis, the dead church. Philadelphia, the faithful church. And Laodicea, the lukewarm church. Now you'll find that every church has a calling and a vision from God. So I cannot say that, uh, you know, uh, because every church is unique. So you cannot find a church in our present day that would exactly fit any of these churches to the very detail. So you find the messages here may apply in part to some churches and not to others. So as I said, that this uh, message to the churches is to the entire church for the entire church age. Amen? Mm. So let's first look at the church in Ephesus. Let's read from chapters uh, 2, verse 2. Okay, to the angel, verse 1, of the church of Ephesus write, These things say he, who holds the, the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Verse 3. And you have persevered, and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But you have this, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Verse 7, He who has a ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, firstly, i just like to mention here that uh, John uh, addressed uh, this letter as directed by Jesus to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Uh, now, that word angel actually uh, refers to the word, it's the same as the word messenger. You could actually translate it as to the angel of the church, but many translators also would translate uh, the word messenger as to the pastor of the church of Ephesus. Okay, so here we have a uh, the meaning of the word uh, angel. It means messenger or it also means pastor of the church. And so he wrote there and he said, These things says he who holds the seven stars, which means that he's holding the stars uh, I think in uh, the previous lesson, we saw that the stars were the angels. 
they remember that symbols I use uh, in the book of Revelation and uh, it was explained to us I think in the previous slide that these stars are the angels okay so uh, symbols are used consistently stars uh, uh, refer to angels or messengers and can be translated as pastors whereas when you find uh, a falling star it is a fallen angel okay a falling star is a fallen angel a star is an angel okay so when you read the book of angel when you read the star falling down it's a fallen angel not not the meteorite or, or a physical star or a sun that is you know from the planet a, a, a kind of planet that radiates uh, heat and uh, ultraviolet light but it is a, a falling star is in the book of Revelation. It's, it is symbolic of a fallen angel. That means they belong to Satan and his cohort. Okay? Mm. Now, uh, here the church of Ephesus, they were commended for their uh, works, for their service, mm. their sacrifice. And uh, you could say that... Um, you know, they actually enjoy very... They, they, they maybe can be compared to a mega church nowadays. In our time and era, maybe I would liken them to a mega church with a famous pastor. Okay? Because Ephesus was like that. But Ephesus was the biggest of all the churches there. It was a kind of a mega church. And they had a famous preacher there. As a pastor, Paul was a pastor of this mega church. So you could say he was like a superstar. And after Paul came Timothy, and then Timothy was John. So they had a lot of superstars or famous pastors that were pastoring this church. Well, anyway, they uh, enjoyed these famous pastors, but the, the Lord reminded them that he was the one who holds the stars. He's the one who is holding the pastors. He's the one who is placing them in their positions of authority in the church. He's telling them they are not in control. He is in control. Jesus is the head of the church and he is in control of the church. So even though we may Think, yes, it's true, the, church, the, the pastors are the under-shepherd, but the one who is really the head of the church is Jesus Christ himself. Mm. He is the head of the church. So he's reminding this church that he is the one who is in control. And he's also, I think, reminding us that, you know, however charismatic that pastor may be, however famous that pastor may be, however eloquent that pastor may be, we should not worship the pastor. We have to worship the one who is the head or the one who puts the pastor in his position. And that is we should worship Jesus Christ himself. So, you know, I think it's a reminder to us because, you know, sometimes as human beings, we have this tendency to want to idolize people. We idolize our pastors. Uh, we may even idolize famous men of God and, you know, uh, quote them a lot, you know. And maybe we may even read their books at the expense of reading the Bible, which I find, you know, is uh, quite sad today because many people don't read the Bible, but they read the books of their pastors. So may I recommend to you that, you know, we should be reading the Bible. The Bible is the book that we should read. It is, maybe you could say, it is the only book that we should read because this is the Word of God. And this is the love letter of God to His people. So we should be reading the Bible every day and you know we should be uh, uh, feeding from the word of God rather than feeding from you know articles and magazines and things like that of course all these are helps but they are not 
the inspired word of God. Only this is the inspired word of God. So let's be reminded that, you know, we should be reading the Bible. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, Brother Hagen, you know, he used to tell his uh, people that, you know, whatever I say, you really have to test it against the word of God. Don't believe everything that I say. Because if I am speaking nonsense, if it is not in line with the word, just throw it away. He said that. So uh, I'm saying the same thing to you too. You know, if I'm speaking out of line with this book, just throw whatever I say. It's not going to hurt my ego. Hallelujah. You know, just throw it away. Because God's word stands forever. Amen. These Christians in the uh, church of Ephesus, they were commended. And Jesus began with a commendation. He said he commended them for their service. He commended them for their uh, sacrifice. He commended them for their patience. And we can see that uh, this church was a very, very hardworking church. They worked from day to night. They, they worked from night to day. Actually, the word here says that their service uh, gives the impression that they toil to the point of exhaustion and they endured under trial. So they were really, really a very, very hardworking bunch. Amen. Amen. Which is true for many, many churches here, you know. Uh, I think many, many Christians here uh, have worked very, very hard and all over the world they work very hard even to the point of exhaustion. Exhaustion, but uh, uh, you know Jesus uh, commanded them there, but he said that there was something that uh, they lacked, and that they were so busy that they lost their first love. Too busy, too busy to do quiet time, too busy to spend in intimate time with the Lord, and I must confess that you know. I'm also guilty of that because, you know, if you're a minister of God, sometimes you can be preaching from day, from morning to night. You know, if you ever visit China and, uh, uh, you know, visit the church there, they're so hungry for the word. They make you preach from 9 o'clock in the morning, morning to 9 o'clock at night. And after you finish 9 o'clock, they will bombard you with questions until 12 midnight. And then... They'll ask you, can you come and pray at 5 a.m.? <laughs> After that, you're exhausted already, you know. So, you know, I can I can really empathize with that because, you know, people are hungry, you know, sometimes you as a minister, sometimes you can fall to the temptation or maybe fall to the trap of just ministering, 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 and you get so busy that you don't have time even for the Lord. But this church was so busy, they lost their first love. Let me say something about uh, the first love. This church uh, lost their first love. And if you remember that Paul, when he talked about the love of God, uh, Paul was the one that wrote the book of Ephesians. Remember? You remember? Do you remember the prayer of Ephesians, the epistle prayers? Ephesians chapter 3, he told the Ephesians, you know, that you should be rooted, you should be grounded in the love of God. He told them, uh, he wanted them to be strengthened with all might and power. And he told them that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. And he told them to be very careful, to be grounded in the love of Christ, to be rooted in the love of Christ, to be established in the love of Christ, and he said, so that you may know the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of that love. And to know that that love surpasses all knowledge that is even beyond the human experience that we may experience. Because this love will carry you through. But unfortunately, I think this church seemed to have forgotten to pray that prayer for themselves or they may have forgotten to practice what Paul had written 
in the Epistle Press. So you can go back and read the Epistle Press. You know, the Epistle Press are, uh, you know, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 onwards, Paul prayed that the eyes of the heart may be flooded with light, mm. that, they may, that they may know the hope of their calling, that they may know the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and that they may know the incomparably great power that is at work in them and for them. Mm -hmm. The Amplified Bible says that that power is working in them, that power is working for them, that power is working through them who believe. And that power is like the working of His mighty strength which He exerted in Christ Jesus when He raised Him from the dead and uh, seated him at the right hand of God in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, above every name that can be named, above all power, above every title that can be given to anybody and this power has been given on behalf of the church or for the benefit of the church. And so Paul talked about the love of God in the epistle to the Ephesians. He talked about it is with, because of the love of God that we, has, that we who were once dead in our sin that we have been made alive in Christ. It is because of the love of God that we are selected. It is because of the love of God that we have been chosen. It is because of the love of God that we have been uh, accepted in the beloved and it is because of the Lord, the love of God that we have been saved by grace through faith. But the church at Ephesus, they seem to have forgotten this. They forgot. And uh, they forgot their first love. No, I guess there are two ways in which you can look at this. Two ways in which we, we can look in, at this fact that they lost their first love. Firstly, they forgot the fervor that they had, which is the usual application that the most Christians have. That, you know, when I first got saved, uh, I was so fervent for the Lord. I was full of fire. You know, I went to every meeting and... You know, everything was so fresh. So it was like they were in their honeymoon season. And then after when they got married for a while, you know, things began to settle down to being mundane. And they started to take one another for granted. So these are things that can happen in a, in a marriage. But Jesus said, you know, uh, you know, let's keep the fire hot. Let's live as though we are always on honeymoon. Amen. So they seem to have forgotten their uh, first love. And, you know, uh, here I think most, uh, most of us Christians, we, we apply it in, in that way. You know, oh yeah, you know, last time when I was first a Christian, uh, you know, after I got saved, wow, you know, everything was so beautiful. I went to every meeting, I served in every committee. And after working so hard, you know, we kind of drag our feet and it becomes an obligation instead. We do things out of obligation rather than do things out of love or passion. That's one way in which we can, uh, in which people apply uh, the, the, the losing of the first love. Another way that I thought that we can apply the losing of the first love is that no, we forget that He first loved us. Because John said, we love because He first loved us. So when Jesus said, you forgot your first love, we forgot that He first loved us. And it's because of His first love that He first loved us. And that's why we, in response, we love Him back. So that's why we, we need to take, like somebody used to tell, say this, you know, we, we need to take love breaks 
there used to be uh, an advertisement in Kit Kat. I know I don't know whether any of you like to eat the chocolate Kit Kat. Kit Kat. Uh, and in that advertisement, they say let's take a Kit Kat break, a uh, chocolate break. Well, uh, somebody used to joke say, uh, don't just take a chocolate break, take a love break. You know, once in a while, you know, when you're walking down the road, just pause for a while and tell yourself, oh, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. So it's good to remind ourselves, you know, as we're walking down the road. Oh yeah, yeah, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Yeah. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. So it's good to remind ourselves of the love of God. And I, I, I also need that because, you know, whenever I think, think of the love of God, you know, I, I think I can cry all over again how much Jesus loves me. You know, really, you know, I, I remember that um, when, uh, when I first got saved, when I went to church, I cried at every service. I cried at every service. I just couldn't stop crying because the love of God is so overwhelming. And you know, today, you know, as I think about the love of God, I can still cry. And it's good to cry. And to remember and to remind ourselves that, yes, Jesus still loves me. In spite of my mistakes, in spite of my uh, imperfections, in spite of my, you know, I've thought wrong or done wrong or said wrong, in spite of all those mistakes, Jesus still loves me. He has not lost his love for me. And his love for me has, is always constant. It's always perfect. He always loves me perfectly. So this church, they were so busy that they lost their first love. They, they forgot to remind themselves that he first loved them so that they could respond back to his first love. Amen. The next point here, they examine and try the false teachers. So these uh, Ephesian Christians, they were quite uh, discerning. Uh, they uh, did not, uh, you know, embrace everything that everybody, uh, anybody just who came to be an apostle. They just didn't embrace what anybody said, even though they claimed to be a false apostle, but they actually tried or examine their teaching against the scripture. So that's one thing good. However, because uh, they were maybe so busy doing that, they forgot to walk in love. So they were so um, focused on ma making corrections. They were so focused on finding, finding the wrongdoing that they forgot to walk in the love of God and the love of God is patient it is kind you know it is not selfish it is uh, you know it is always giving and so on so they forgot that but they were so busy you know just trying to correct everything and everybody that uh, you know this was the thing that Jesus said that he could not command them they also examined and tried the Nicolaitans they examined them and hated what they did. I will explain what the Nicolaitans are later on when we talk about the church at Pagamos. Let's look at this other thing about the church. Jesus said they were spiritually fallen. He didn't say that they were about to fall. They said they, they were fallen. That means their, their Christian walk was far below their spiritual position. Remember in the book of Ephesians, Paul tells us, you have been raised with Christ. Mm. You have been raised together with Christ 
you are seated together with Christ at the right hand of God the Father in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. So Paul told them the spiritual position. They were raised. They were raised to a very high position, but unfortunately, they were not practicing what Jesus had done for them. They had already fallen from that position. Not that they fell from that position uh, in status spiritually, but in their actual walk, in their practice, they were living far below their spiritual position. Amen. Well, this church was very busy, but this church had heart trouble and nobody knew about it except Jesus. And it's true that you can have heart trouble and nobody knows about it. Because, you know, last year I had tr heart trouble. Uh, and uh, on the outside, you know, those people who were my in my uh, Bible study group, they were shocked when uh, I had a stroke. They said, but you look very healthy. Say yes, I'm healthy. Because uh, I was going on walks, I was uh, exercising, I was eating right, doing everything right seemingly but i had heart trouble because at night my heart would uh, sometimes run very fast uh and maybe it's also a message to me because i when i read this message i said yeah maybe uh this message is for me this message is for me you know you can be very busy doing everything but nobody knows you have heart trouble but you have and it shows so this church was having heart trouble even from the outside they were showing fruit that appeared to be good but um, it was not fruit that came out of love they were doing things you know they were busy they were just doing things you know do 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 maybe out of uh, habit out of obligation but their heart was not in what they did mm. so anyway jesus revealed himself as the one who holds the seven stars and as the one who walks in the midst in the midst of the candlestick and he said i commend you for all these these things i commend you for your hard work for your patience for your sacrifice but this is one thing i personally have against you those are very strong words mm. this is the one thing that i cannot commend you that you have lost your first love. So how do we love, live our first love? Well, the word live is to voluntarily release something that was once held dear. Perhaps we got distracted with other loves. That's possible, you know. In a, in a society like Singapore, when you walk down Orchard Road, there are a lot of loves you know, that try to get your attention. That there, there are a lot of uh, advertisements that try to get your attention, you know. And even in internet, you know, there's hobbies, you know, you can go and uh, go and do your hobbies. That's one love that you can, that can compete with this first love. Because to love God first is to give Him everything. First in importance, first in time, First in everything. So something that you held once dear, you neglect or you leave someone behind or leave something behind. So instead of doing things first, like doing a quiet time first, uh, you know, we may do our ministry first. We may do our, you know, study first. Uh, instead of spending that quality time talking to the Lord and communing with Him. So this is one thing, you know, this church really speaks to me. It really speaks to me, you know. Uh, this church, apparently, they had excessive activities and programs. Too many. And it was a cover-up for their lack of intimacy. They had the appearance of fruitfulness, but they had lost their first love, intimacy. And this is what the Lord desired of them. So could I say this, that labor 
is no substitute for love. Amen. Labor is no substitute for love. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go to the next church. This is the church at Smyrna. The word Smyrna means bitter, and it is derived from the word myrrh. Myrrh is uh, spice that, that is bitter. It's also used for healing. And it was uh, an important center for emperor worship. Remember that during the Roman Empire, uh, you know, the first emperor was Julius Caesar, mm -hmm. and then he passed Augustus. over his uh, empire to Augustus Caesar, and it was through Augustus that slowly what developed out of that empire was they began to worship the emperor. So the worship of the emperor became more and more popular. Mm -hmm. So as people, you know, they used, the Greeks used to worship the Greek gods. But as the Romans took over, uh, the worship of the Greek gods waned. And instead, the people transferred their worship from the Greek gods to the Roman emperor. So the Roman emperor then became like a deity. And uh, as more and more of Rome, uh, the Roman or the world at that time uh, was conquered, uh, this emperor worship gained in popularity and you know Smyrna was one of the centers where it was very very popular and it was an important center probably the first center where they started emperor worship mm -hmm. so when they started this emperor worship of course the Christians there they refused to worship and they because they refused to worship one of the ways in which they worship was to bow down to the emperor the other way was when they go to the market, they were supposed to take the incense at the market and throw it at some kind of a bowl to, uh, to just to honor the emperor as a god. Mm. And of course, um, Christians refused to do that. So because they were, uh, you know, they were openly disobeying the, you know, the rule of the land at that time, uh, they were persecuted for their faith and they were persecuted according to the scripture if you read uh, the text in um, Revelation chapter 2 from verse 8 to verse 11 uh, if you read the Greek text it says they were they were persecuted to the point of abject poverty they were poor to the point of abject poverty and they possessed absolutely nothing because they would be uh, you know their, their property would be taken away from them they will not be given the, the the good jobs or the good jobs will be given to people who uh, who worship the emperor they were given the most mean jobs maybe the as a road sweeper uh, maybe they had to beg on the streets the uh, jobs were not available and in those times, they were having, you know, trade associations. Mm. So if you belong to some kind of a trade association, they will not allow you to go into the trade association. So you could not trade or do your business uh, in, in Smyrna. Okay. So they were uh, persecuted to the point of object, abject poverty. And they were slandered not only by the Jews, but also by the Gentiles and both Jews and Gentiles persecuted them. So this is a picture of the, of the bishop uh, at Smyr Smyrna. He was burned to the stake. His name is Polycarp. He was a disciple of John and he was publicly burned at the stake. And this is what he said when they burned him. They wanted him to, to reject Jesus. But this is what he said, no. He said, 86 years have I served him and he never did me wrong. How can I now blaspheme my king that has saved me? So what happened was when the fire uh, was uh, started, the fire failed to consume him. And because he they couldn't, uh, the fire couldn't consume him, his body. Eventually, the people 
took a knife and started started to step in to them. So this church was a badly persecuted. However, what people see from the outside, they see that they are very poor. That they see they see that they are so much to be pitied. Christ considered them rich. Hallelujah. Mm. So Jesus has a different diagnosis, isn't it? Mm. You know, people may say you are, you know, you are such and such, but Jesus may say the very opposite. People may say, oh, you are so poor, poor thing, but Jesus says, no, you are rich. So God's praise is better than man's approval. This is what we can learn from the church at Smyrna. Smyrna is called the persecuted church. Jesus revealed himself as the one who is the first and the last. He also revealed himself as the resurrected one. And so he gave them a very strong word of encouragement. He said, don't be afraid. Even if the suffering increases, Jesus said, don't be afraid. Don't fear. Don't fear. And he encouraged them that their tribulation would be 10 days. What does 10 days mean? 10 days means that it will be only a short time. It's going to be brief. You'll be able to overcome it. You'll be able to overcome this short time of persecuted because it's only a short time compared to eternity. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And Jesus promised the crown of life to them for their martyrdom. So then, this is what Jesus promised them. In John chapter 16, 30, in 33, remember that John the Apostle, who wrote Revelation, also wrote John 16, 33. He said, I'm reading from the Amplified, Amplified Bible. He said, I told you these things so that in me, you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world, you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration, but be of good cheer. That means, you know, cheer up, be encouraged, take courage, be confident, be certain, be undaunted, for I have overcome the world. In other words, I have deprived the world of power to harm you and I have conquered it for you. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Jesus has overcome the world and he didn't just overcome the world for himself. He overcame the world for Amen. us. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Oh, that's such a strong word of encouragement. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Five minutes left. Last church, Pergamos, is the compromising church. Pergamos was considered the greatest city in Asia Minor, and it is considered the place of Satan's seat. Uh, probably because it was full of temples and one of the temples that was there was this uh, altar of Zeus. Zeus was the Greek, Greek god. Uh, he was supposed to be the number one Greek god. And so his seat has been found. I showed you the picture of this seat in the part one of the seminar. If you have missed that, uh, write in and we'll send you the videos of the first seminar and you see the uh, picture of this seat here is taken to the museum in Berlin and it is called the seat of Satan and this is where the altar uh, of uh, Zeus uh, where at the altar many animals were sacrificed there okay so here Pergamos was the place where they had uh, the greater city in Asia Minor because it was full of temples and the uh, Satan's seat was there. Now the word Pergamos means married. Okay, they were married but they committed adultery because, you know, there were many gods in Pergamos. Uh, they had a temple of the emperor there 
also. They also had Zeus uh, temple there. Uh, by the way, uh, Pergamos was also a university town. So another type of temple they had was this temple that was dedicated to this god of healing. The god of medicine. The god of medicine. Which to me is quite um, significant because, you know, COVID has a lot to do with medical healing and medical things, medical terms. And by the way, the, the medical symbol, I think, of the two uh, snakes is actually taken from this god called Asculapius. He's the god, the Greek god of healing and of medicinal arts. And he used to practice his therapy at the temple. And because there was a lot of research done there, uh, Pergamos was like a university town that had a lot of doctors there and they practiced this medicine and therapy, healing so-called and uh, the medical uh, fraternity has taken the, the symbol of this god as the medical symbol. They didn't use Moses' staff, uh, you know. At first, I used to think that they took it from the Moses uh, put up a staff and he put a serpent there and that serpent was supposed to represent Jesus on the cross. At first, I thought that they had taken that symbol to represent them, but apparently they did not. In fact, they took the symbol of a Greek god to represent their uh, medical fraternity. Okay, anyway, Pogamos, this word means married, and, uh, but they committed adultery by, you know, worshipping other gods. Now, Pogamos was uh, also a church where they compromised with the Nicolaitans. Okay, let's find out who the Nicolaitans are. This word Nicolaitans means people who lord over other people. They lord over other people. They were acting like the rest of the world. You remember? You know, Jesus told his disciples in the Gospels, he said the people in this world, they lord over others. The leaders in this world, they lord over others. Just like the, you know, the Roman army, for example. If, uh, if they want you to do, if they are a commander or a leader, they'll just order you around and command you around and tell you what to do and they will just exercise control and dominion and they will uh, keep on directing and dominate you and tell you what to do. So Jesus said, you know, the leadership that uh, is Christ-like is uh, leaders that are servants, servant leaders, not leaders who will lord over other people. But these Nicolaitans, they, this word means to conquer the people. So they practice what we call lording over people. They maybe had the personality that was always domineering and dominating. So they always like to control people and tell people what to do. And in fact, they were the ones who maybe probably, history tells us they probably invented this division between clergy and laity. They invented so they said, we, in those who are ministers, you are one up, you are superior. Those who are the members of the, bo uh, of the body, you are the lay people, you are below. So I think church history tells us this was what was practiced. So those uh, who were the pastors or who were the priests, they said, oh, you lay people, you don't know how to read the Bible. You don't know how to interpret it the Bible, only we can interpret it for you. So they practice this di distinction between leader and member. And so they, there was this false division. Uh, they practice this uh, kind of old covenant uh, division that the priest had to be the mediator between the people. So the people could not pray to God they have to pray through a mediator. 
victory. And Jesus said he hates it. He hates this. Which means that, you know, if Jesus hates something, we should also hate the same thing that he hates. Because God never made this division between clergy and laity. All of us can hear the Holy Spirit. All of us can be led by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 verse 14 and 16 says that for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. This verse didn't say only the pastors or only the priests or only the clergy are led by the, by the Spirit of God. This verse says as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. So there was this false division where the clergy said, you know, the people who are so-called laymen, they couldn't hear from God, they couldn't speak to God, they couldn't pray to God, you have to come through me. Mm -hmm. If I'm a clergy, if I'm a clergyman, bring all your prayers to me, bring all your confessions to me, uh, you can confess your sin to me, you cannot go directly to God. So that was how, you know, uh, church history shows us that this practice was being practiced mm -hmm. in the early church. So this is a false division because the Bible tells us that he makes all of us kings and priests. Mm -hmm. So everybody is a king, everybody is a priest, and the, the clergy, so to speak, they are just officers. They are office, they are like every other member and they are supposed to be ministers. They are servant leaders. They are not lords. They shouldn't be commanding and dominating and domineering and controlling what other people do. They should serve or they should minister by serving in the same way that Jesus ministered by serving. And that's why Jesus, you know, taught the disciples, this is the kind of leadership I want you to have. Be a servant leader. And he washed the feet of Peter. And Peter, you know, was the one, one of those who practiced this lording over. Because Peter said, you know, I, I'm boss. You know, all you others, you know, serve me. Uh, these are the things that have been practiced. But Jesus said, no, if you're going to be a leader, this is not the kind of leadership I want. I want you to be a servant leader. They separated Christ's body into clergy and laity. And one other thing that they did, they embraced the teaching of Balaam. Balaam, his name means Lord of the people. And if you know that Old Testament story, Balaam was a, was a prophet. He was uh, offered uh, money by a king. Mm -hmm. And this king, his name is Balak. Balak offered him money to curse Israel. Balaam was a so-called prophet. Uh, if you read, if you, if you study that story and follow it from all the way from Old Testament to New Testament, you will find that the New Testament actually describes Balaam as a soothsayer. That means he is a medium. He's not a real prophet. He's a false prophet. He's a soothsayer. That means someone who dabbles with fortune telling. Okay. His name means Lord of the people. And because he had this gift, he corrupted the gift of uh, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom. He corrupted the gift that God gave him and used it for fortune telling and he was offered money by the king uh, by king Balak who wanted him to curse Israel but when he spoke the words he could not curse Israel instead whenever he opened his mouth only blessing would come out so uh, Balak was very frustrated he said how come I ask you to curse them you go and bless them and Balaam uh, actually thought of a strategy how to uh, entice the children of Israel to sin 
against God. So uh, Balaam told the king, uh, why don't you uh, just get them to invite them to your feast, you know? Ask them to come and have dinner with you. Uh, in other words, uh, if you can't get them to, if you can't beat them, why don't you get them to join you? You know, uh, just just have fellowship. What's wrong with just having, you know, dinner together and you know, uh, chit chatting and you know, uh, having fun together? So what they did was they they had these parties, and the Gentile women. The women, the Moabites and all those other women of the other nations, they went in and seduced the children of Israel and got them to marry them. Uh, and so in doing so, they introduced the, the practices of the Gentile nations in idolatry to the Israelites. And so because of that, Israel was stumbled and Israel got into adultery by worshipping the other gods. Mm. So let's remember that in James chapter 4, James tells us that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Now this doesn't mean that we don't become friends with non-Christians. We make friends with non-Christians to win them over. But just make sure that we don't embrace mm. their values mm that we don't embrace their ways mm. and the purpose is to win them over but you know if we become friends with them by embracing their values and embracing uh, you know their ideas then what ends up is that we become friends of the world and we end up becoming an enemy of God Amen so mm. let's just be uh, mindful of that and be you know, mindful that we don't want to, you know, if they embrace the ways of the world, like, you know, making status very important, uh, you know, making money very important, you know, all these kind of uh, practices ruling over the people and so on. Let's say, you know, these are not God's ways. I will follow God's ways. Uh, money may be uh, necessary to live in this world, but it is not the most important thing. God is more important than money. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Jesus revealed himself as the one who has a sharp sword, the one who was dead and came to life. And those who refused to bow to Caesar would get the Roman sword. So in wrapping up, may I say this. It is more important to fear Christ's sword than to fear the Roman sword. And this was what one of the people in uh, Pergamos did because there was this guy called Antipas. He refused to bow to Caesar and he, he actually got the Roman sword. He was also burned. He was also um, persecuted to the point of death. And so uh, they, there was a remnant there who did not compromise. But Jesus was speaking to the whole church and he said, be careful that you don't compromise in this. You should fear the sword that comes from Jesus Christ and his word rather than death that comes from the Roman sword. Amen. Okay, so with that, let's just uh, stop here for a minute and let's just give thanks. Father, we give thanks to you. We thank you for your written word. We thank you for your spoken word, Lord. I pray that your word would be life and spirit to us, that your word would be rhema to us, the word spoken by the mouth of Christ himself, so that faith may come. For you said faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, the word that comes from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. So we pray that as your word is shared, that it will come out, like a, light, uh, like a sharp double-edged sword that it will pierce between bone and marrow. It will divide between soul and spirit and that it will uh, discern the innermost uh, recesses of our heart so that we may know how to walk in ways that are pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.